Good afternoon, and welcome to Colonial Williamsburg's Trades Tuesday. Welcome to the Durfee shop as well, our tailor shop on the west end of town, which we're very excited will be opening up at the very end of this week after being closed for over a year. I'm Michael, I'm the journeyman tailor here in the tailor shop. Today, we'll be looking at a variety of accessories that were, well, a part of men's daily dress, as well as things that obviously were for special occasions, things that are beautiful, things that also are very utilitarian. Uh, now, as this is a live stream, this is your opportunity to interact with us uh, from your home or wherever you're watching today. So please send in questions and we'll try to get to them during the course of this live stream. And if they don't get to me, uh, I'll do my best to answer them in the, the comment section uh, tomorrow or later in this week. As a tailor, of course, I'm generally dealing with the making of men's clothing, or really solely dealing with the making of men's and some women's items, all through measurement and pattern. But to be dressed in the 18th century was not just to put on your breeches, waistcoat, and coat. A variety of other items today we would call accessories helped to complete the dress of any man in the 18th century. Now these items, what we might call millinery in the 18th century, or ornaments, complements to the wardrobe, are not something you would come to a tailor to buy. There was lots of retail in 18th century Williamsburg, dozens of just general merchant storehouses. There were jeweler shops, milliner shops, and haberdasherers that all sold a variety of items for men's wardrobes. You wouldn't go there to buy a coat, but you could certainly go there to buy some of the things we're going to be looking at today. Now, right now, I really am unadorned. I'm in my, my breeches, my shoes and stockings, my shirts, and in this case, my wrapping gown. My shirt has just been buttoned at the neck, and it's rare to see in the 18th century men going without some sort of neckwear. Really, the most common neckwear in the 18th century is a cravat, also known as a roller, or a neckcloth. It's just a strip of fabric. Now, that's what I have here. Um, anywhere from generally 6 inches to 11 inches wide, but then quite long, anywhere from you know, about 54 to 60, 65 inches long, depending on the specific time in the 18th century. Well, a variety of neckwear have been worn throughout the, the past. This style of long strip of fabric being tied around the neck really comes in in the later part of the 17th century and is worn throughout the 18th century until the, the neckwear changes in its fashion. Now I'd like to demonstrate as to how this goes on. I'm going to walk over here. I've got a mirror here, as it's a little hard uh, uh, to do without looking at oneself. A mirror or looking glass is quite a common feature in, in homes, um, but there are times where I can do this without looking at myself in the mirror. You'll notice my shirt has a, has a collar upon it, and collars of 18th century shirts exist in a variety of heights. This one, quite high, is meant to fold all the way over the neckcloth. Images from the 18th century show varying amounts of the shirt collar coming over the neckwear, from those that simply peek out over the top of the edge of the neckwear, those that fold all the way down to the bottom of the neck, as this one uh, will. Some images from the 18th century also seem to indicate that the shirt collar was kept completely below the neckwear, which is often a style that I wear day to day. The neck cloth to put on is held in the hands. The center of the cloth is, is held between the hands and it's gathered in the hands. This is then brought to the neck and holding it quite close to the neck, firm, tight, it's crossed behind. It's important that it be adjusted to the desired height that you want it. It's important that it's smooth, but also that it is gathered, not perfectly gathered. This is not something that we would see finely pleated by a laundress, but gathered a bit more uh, freely in the hand as you saw me. 
This is then simply tied. There are not many ways that a cravat is tied in the 18th century. In 1827, The Art of the Tying of the Cravat is published, and it has 83 different ways of tying the cravat. But it's a different shaped cravat than you just saw me put on. Now, the, the ends of the cravat are tucked generally into the bosom slit of the shirt. Not always. There are images of the ends hanging out. Uh, but in this case, we're going to secure it in the bosom slit of my shirt, and I'm going to do so with a shirt buckle. It's just a pin or brooch that holds everything together. It, is, it can be both seen or unseen. I've got a nice little paste buckle here. Of course, looking in the, in the mirror to make sure everything's right, bringing that collar of the shirt, keeping it even round the neck. Having a clean shirt and clean neckwear was certainly important for any man in the 18th century to have them not clean would be considered very slovenly. So I think I'm looking pretty good here now. Many people ask me if this is comfortable. It certainly is one of those things that one must get used to. Uh, and even in the summer months when it's hot, it's just more fabric for me to sweat into. And so it's not too burdensome on, on all but the hottest days. Of course, once my neck cloth is on, I should probably put my, my waistcoat on. There are a variety of different shirt brooches or shirt pins in the 18th century. These are some fairly common uh, shapes, uh, a, a crooked heart. Um, sometimes you see that referred to as a witch's heart and a common circle ring brooch is seen here. Not, new, not too dissimilar from silver ring brooches that are seen in the uh, fur trade in the 18th century, a trade with Native Americans. Uh, both in this region and much farther west throughout the 17th century, 18th century, and even into the 19th century, um, and is still a part of um, some powwow dress uh, today. These, as I said, secure the neckwear to the shirt. But not every neckwear is secured to the shirt. Uh, another common neckwear in the 18th century is a stock. The stock is a pleated piece of fabric into a band. Now, in this case, the pleated piece of fabric is cotton, a very fine cotton. There are 44 inches of cotton here gathered into this neck band that holds the buckle. On the other end is the, the tab that will go through that buckle. And this goes round the neck, once again, the shirt collar coming up over that. Stocks versus cravats, we see them come in and out of fashion. By the time around the American Revolution, the stock is generally what a man's going to be wearing for formal wear or more formal wear. Um, they can be, as this example is, all of that fine cotton gathered in, and certainly there are those that survive that are not of the same quality that this is. So just as in all the items you see here today, they existed in a range of qualities and prices in the 18th century. Manufacturers and retailers in the 18th century knew that if they could sell to everyone, they could make a profit off everyone, rather than just trying to sell expensive things to those that could afford it. So while the cravat and the stock are, are really the classic neckwear of the 18th century, there is another piece of neckwear that we see, see quite regularly in the 18th century, worn by men when sporting, out hunting or other sporting pursuits, um, as well as very informally. Something you might see on a tradesman here today, and that's a, a handkerchief tied around the neck. Handkerchiefs in the 18th century could be everything from just a plain linen handkerchief. Uh, this is a copper plate printed handkerchief. And these are two printed silk handkerchiefs. They exist in a wide range of quality and style in the 18th century. But this is something that was definitely within the, within the reach of just about any person. We see uh, uh, advertisements for runaway enslaved individuals where printed silk handkerchiefs are listed among those individuals' items they've taken with them. A handkerchief can be tied around the head, around the neck, can be ha hanging out of the pocket. There are images of them being tied all the way around a hat in the 18th century in the winter to keep the hat on your head, but also to keep the, the ears clean, uh, or sorry, the ears warm. Uh, they're certainly just 
put in the pocket to blow your nose into. So really multi-purpose item in the 18th century, um, but certainly can be used as a form of neckwear. Now I'd like to back up a little bit. I talked about having my breeches on, but there is some accessory pieces that are necessary in putting your breeches on in the 18th century, and that's going to be garter buckles. I have a pair of breeches, a, a pair of my wool breeches here. Uh, this is actually a very light uh, weight wool, very comfortable in the spring and even in the summer. So in the breeches here, here you see the, the buttons and buttonholes at the knees, and when those are done up, it leaves this band which goes just below the knee, and that's called the garter or the knee band. A buckle is inserted, as you can see here, it has this T-bar behind, is inserted into that buttonhole, locked in there, and then to secure it around the bottom of the, the leg or the bottom of the knee, or just under the knee, there are the tines there that should be good and sharp to pierce through, and then the band there is secured. And that will keep the stockings up, the breeches down, but it also is a piece that can be changed in and out. Fashions for buckles like these changed very quickly, and in some cases, much quicker than the fashion for the breeches changed. And so buying new buckles is, is not an uncommon thing in the 18th century. These ones I have on the breeches now are just common brass, but they could, could certainly be uh, uh, steel or iron, they could be gold or silver, they could be gilt or plated, uh, common metals. Uh, these here are a plated metal with glass stone, so probably not going to put this garter buckle onto this pair of breeches, but certainly on a nicer pair of, of breeches for evening wear. This is going to be light, bright, and sparkly. So certainly different kinds of of buckles for your breeches, but also for your shoes. In fact, to match those garter buckles, you'd need some equally shiny shoe buckles. Shoe buckles in the 18th century, um, too, change fashion very quickly, and they exist in all the same range of metal. In fact, this is an interesting original pair. Well, the center metal is of iron. The outer part is brass that's been tin plated, uh, which is an interesting combination of metal. Uh, that's an original pair that I picked up a few years ago. This pair is common brass. It's just been cast with uh, metal inner parts or with a, a, this seems to be oh, just brass on the inside as well. Shoe buckle parts show up in archeological finds here in Colonial Williamsburg and really in just about every, uh, every dig in the, uh, of 18th century sites, you see shoe buckle parts, knee buckle parts, certainly common accessories worn by all people. It's really the lowest form of, uh, the lowest person in the 18th century that might not have knee buckles or shoe buckles. Uh, tied shoes don't become fashionable until the 1780s. Uh, and so buckles are a mainstay for, for everyone in the 18th century. Uh, and they certainly existed, once again, in a range of prices. Now let's move on to maybe a little bit more uh, in getting dressed in the 18th century. Of course, just going to work in the 18th century here in Williamsburg was not really all that dangerous. This was a fairly safe community, but we do know of individuals that left their homes and went out for maybe the afternoon and the evening armed. Thomas Jefferson and his wife, Martha, purchased a pistol from Margaret Hunter's milliner shop. Now that pistol was actually purchased for Martha. So we know that not just men were armed here, but women as well. So small pistols, as it most likely was, uh, could have been kept within the pocket. Uh, that seems to be less important around the city here. Uh, perhaps Martha meant to use that to keep her safe when traveling in the countryside. But the wearing of swords was certainly something that we know happened here. In fact, a very famous incident happens uh, within a tavern here in town when after a dispute or during a dispute, 
a man pulls out his sword and stabs one of the other men at the table. This is a part of a, a very important uh, court case that becomes known as the Chiswell Bucktrout Affair. Um, I won't go into all the details there. You can certainly look it up. Um, but I have a small sword here. Um, this style of sword is known as a small sword in the 18th century. This is a beautiful silver example. It's a reproduction. Swords were hung from a sword belt, and there's a few different arrangements of sword belts in the 18th century. But that sword belt was not generally seen while being worn. The sword belt is, is worn round the waist, but below the waistcoat, uh, and so just hangs underneath. How many men walked around this city in swords? We really don't know, and I, I doubt that many. But we do know they were for sale here in the city. We do know that they, they were worn. Uh, we also know that not just swords, but sword canes were available. So walking sticks or canes that had swords hidden inside. The fashion for wearing of swords continued throughout the 18th century, but by the time of the American Revolution, the sword had really given way to the walking stick. The walking stick or cane had been worn throughout the 18th century, but, uh, and could certainly be used as a form of protection, a last resort if one got into trouble. Um, these swords, these small swords, are, are not brutal weapons. They're, they're today what we see in the sport of fencing. They're thin, light blades, and they're really more a form of jewelry. In the right hands, they could be incredibly deadly, but it's really meant to, to be a fashion accessory. This one certainly is. Sword belts that survive from the 18th century are, are few and far between, but those that do show that they could be easily taken off, either with a, an easy release uh, buckle, or they'll have buckles that also have hooks on them so they can, once they've been adjusted to your, uh, your waist size, you can just unhook the item and put it off to the side, as this is a fairly cumbersome thing to sit with. Uh, it certainly can sit off your side while you're sitting, but you're, it's always in the way. I think that's maybe one of the reasons why walking sticks really were more popular. I've got two walking sticks here, um, an, a reproduction and an original. Uh, they could be made out of a variety of different woods, all sorts of qualities. The walking stick here is of Malacca, an imported cane. Um, the, the other one here has an, an, an antler handle. This is certainly showing uh, a sporting fashion to it. Uh, the one thing that I do want to point out is that uh, you're not going to carry a cane and wear your sword. So that is definitely a fashion don't in the 18th century. Um, but there certainly are images of men carrying both. These images are generally meant to show a man going beyond the, the realm of tasteful fashion. Uh, so walking sticks, canes, swords, pocket pistols are certainly a practical um, and fashionable accessory here in 18th century Williamsburg. Of course, it's important that when you go out day to day, you know what time it is. And so Master Hutter, the master tailor here, thank, uh, uh, very graciously loaned me for this live stream today some pocket watches. Pocket watches, we know, were for sale here in town. By the end of the 18th century, they do exist uh, in a range of prices, and we do see them in inventories of individuals at all levels of society. Um, and they do seem to keep very good time. This is a really beautiful example from uh, the mid-18th century, and you can see it open here. Uh, beautiful uh, a gilding, engraving work, chasing work, and pierce work to show the very delicate mechanism. But this was not meant to be seen when worn. In fact, this closes up, showing the face, locking in, and it has a protective case that goes with it. You can see the inside of the case. There is a printed piece of paper showing uh, the dealer of the, the piece. Those two cases together protect it. This has simulated tortoise shell. It's not real tortoise shell, uh, but simulated, very fashionable. And it just has a simple ribbon on it. 
this other piece, um, also like the other one, has multiple cases, but is on an original set of chains. Pocket watches in the 18th century have chains, and on the end of those chains, there are keys, seals, and toys. Keys to wind the watch, seals as a bit of ornamentation, but also could be used with sealing wax when writing letters, and toys, which were just any small bit or bob ornamental piece that were just there because people liked to have them. But these would hang out from a pocket in the breeches known as the fob. Like, let me pull out my pair of blue breeches here. And here on the uh, right side of the breeches, there is a opening. This is the fob. Now, some breeches have a welt pocket upon the waistband, but we also see this upper pocket that's at the very top of the waistband. And I'll put in this reproduction watch with reproduction uh, seal and key and chain, so you can see that slipping in there. And you can see here how those hang. And they just peek out. The waistcoat skirt just comes past that. And you'll see that in images, uh, that you'll see the man's uh, toys, keys, and seals are there. Stepping out in the 18th century often included gloves. Gloves were imported here to the colonies, made by glovers. George Washington, we know, in some cases, is buying his gloves by the gross, a dozen dozen pairs of gloves at a time. They're basically disposable, made out of a durable but inexpensive leather, which is most commonly sheep. But you also see goat and, and other leathers being used, um, but goat and sheep being most common. They're, there's quite a bit of work in a pair of gloves, but they are being mass produced. We know in the 18th century that people are wearing them, and once they become dirty, they just throw them out instead of washing them. In the 19th century and 20th century, the washing of gloves because becomes quite common. But in the 18th century, it does not seem to be the case. Gloves for men tend to be white and natural in color, but we have references to colored gloves as well. Black gloves are certainly seen, uh, and especially for funerals, providing accessories uh, to those that attend funerals was quite common. And one of the most common things was the presenting of gloves. Black gloves uh, and a few mourning gloves survive in the 18th century. He's a reproduction pair of, of black matte gloves uh, there. Gloves came in sizes just as gloves do today. A variety of other accessories will help well, fill your pockets in the 18th century, and a, a pocketbook was certainly one of them. A purse as well for keeping coins. Uh, these were common here in 18th century Williamsburg as they're regularly listed in shops. Your pocketbook holds all sorts of scrap paper, note paper, lottery tickets, ball tickets, uh, anything that you, any, any uh, pieces of paper that you want to keep uh, but keep in good shape. Uh, what you're not going to keep in this pocketbook here in Williamsburg is a lot of printed money, as there was not a lot of printed money around here. But over in England, where printed notes are in use, you certainly will see those within a pocketbook. Uh, most of your currency in the 18th century is coinage, and that goes into your purse, which is a form of knitting known as spraying work, uh, but your coins um, are good and secure within that, that bag. There you can see it right there. A variety of pocket knives show up on the market, obviously just as a, a man or woman might carry a pocket knife today. Uh, not too dissimilar, a blade, usually folding. These folding blades have been around for a long time. Uh, and one of the, um, uh, you see them very small, you see them very large. This is just a common pocket knife. Um, Dominic, do we have any questions? You know, I can talk on and on and on here, but anyone write, write in any questions specifically about anything I've said? 
Absolutely. And before we start with questions, I just want to thank you again for joining us or for sharing your expertise with us, Michael. We're really thrilled to be here in the Taylor shop. And I know the audience, I'm sure, is thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to come in here as soon as this coming weekend. So now for our first question, I um, have something from Christopher. He noticed there's a cue bag on the table and he was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit more about what this is and um, how it would have functioned in the 18th century. Yeah, so well, uh, well noticed. This bag here, a black bag, uh, is, a, is a hair bag, um, is what they seem to be most commonly referred to as. And the purpose of this bag is to put your, your hair, your cue or ponytail, as you might call it today, into the bag. Hair, when being dressed in the 18th century, was dressed with a combination of pomadum and powder. Pomadum or pomade was a grease-based substance that was worked through the hair, and then powder was worked through as well to help set that pomadum for styling. Since the whole hair is powdered, and that powder could be white powder, it could be gray, it could be brown or black, we know it coming in other colors here in the city, uh, you wanted to, or in some cases, wanted to keep that powder off the, your neck or the back of your coat. And so hair bags were in use. So the, the hair hanging from the back of the neck would be put inside the hair bag and closed up, and then this is tied to secure it. Um, these are seen both on the, um, the cue of one's natural hair or of the wig. So it's not a wig bag, it is a hair bag because it's worn by, on both wigs and on one's natural hair. Um, so wigs are certainly a accessory of the 18th century, just as they're still an accessory today. Um, but by the later part of the 18th century, men are choosing to dress their own hair. In fact, George III of England seems to wear his own hair until it begins thinning too much. So uh, right in 1773, it's announced that on his birthday, the king is going to, well, start wearing a wig, really because he can't achieve the desired hairstyle with his own hair. Uh, so if he made it into his 30s without wearing a, a, a wig, clearly it both was in fashion and wasn't in fashion. Uh, my hair right now is in a, a cropped or short style, which is certainly popular here in America, especially here in Virginia, uh, because of the heat. If I want to be in the, the, the high fashion of the time, I'm gonna have to wear a wig to give me the long hair behind, and that could be both wrapped or it could be put within the bag, but is rarely just left hanging behind on its own. Susie was wondering if um, there were specific accessories or accoutrements that the enslaved would wear uh, more frequently than, say, your average population here in Virginia. The handkerchief is really probably one of the most common that we see um, being worn by the enslaved people um, and, and have accounts of them wearing, um, but it's really not the enslaved men wearing them in an unusual way or different from the, the free population of the European population, it's enslaved women. So taking these handkerchiefs and then tying them around their head in styles uh, that were reminiscent of their fashions in Africa or in a style that was unique to them, um, that, that seems to be very fashionable or a distinctive identity for themselves but we do see those styles being copied by free white women in those areas. So specifically in areas like Jamaica or, or uh, Bermuda, um, we see those styles being worn. Um, around here, we have fewer references for that, uh, but we do know of distinctive hairstyles for enslaved individuals that they chose to wear as that wasn't being mandated for them as to what they could and couldn't do. Um, uh, there are other pieces of, of or we could call them accessories. I'm, it, it's hard to call them accessories. And, and probably one of the, um, one that comes to mind are silver collars, um, slave collars, as they're known. It's a, a band um, generally of silver, though they, they could be of other metals that are worn around the neck. They could be uh, locked to the neck with a small, a small lock 
but they were often an indication of rank within the household. And so we see small serving boys with silver collars around the neck and older, uh, even older male servants wearing these collars around the neck, but they're often of silver. Uh, and, and so they're meant to be a piece of, of status for that enslaved individual, but it's still a collar. Um, it's not something that you're going to see a European wearing at all. It's still meant to indicate their placement as a person that is owned by another person, as a piece of property. So Ron was wondering how the cravat of the 18th century compares to the tie of the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah, you still occasionally see the term cravat being associated with men's necktie. Uh, there's a variety of neckwear throughout the 19th century. Um, really, in the, at the turn of the 18th century into the 19th century, the cravat no longer becomes a long strip of fabric, but it's the handkerchief folded into a triangle and then folded up to create the long strip of fabric. And so the cravats of Beau Bremel um, and other dandies of the early 19th century, this is what they're wearing. Uh, it still is a long strip, as I said, uh, and it could have a, a stiffening uh, piece put inside it to help it keep its shape around the neck, but you then have these pointed tabs to tie a more delicate uh, bow uh, or, or knot at the end, rather than the bulk of the whole width of the fabric of the earlier cravat. You see stocks continue to be fashionable throughout the 19th century. Uh, there are uh, stocks that look like they were hand tied, but they are simply buckled or tied or hooked behind the neck. But the necktie as we know it today is really something that's going to come in in the 1870s uh, at the earliest um, and then evolve from there. Um, still a long strip of fabric, but obviously it's not out of plain white. It's out of more patterned fabric um, and starts in very informal uh, sporting wear and then becomes elevated in formality over time. So earlier in the stream, you mentioned that here in Williamsburg in the 18th century, you could expect to find a number of stores selling uh, various accessories and accoutrements. And Doug was wondering specifically if these items, say housed in local stores, would have been made locally or if items like buckles were largely imported. Yeah, these are items that all really would have been imported. If you visit Colonial Williamsburg here, you're going to hear this over and over again, that it was cheaper to make most things overseas, put them on a boat and bring them here. That's commonly how it is today in the 21st century. Labor costs were high here in Colonial America, and so the production of complicated small items uh, was just not something that was being done here. There are a few areas where we see some buckle manufacturing uh, or attempts at buckle manufacturing here in larger scale, but they don't seem to be overly successful. And so um, these items, really all the items you see here, were far more likely to be made over in England. If you were going to see them being made here in the colonies, there's a good chance that they're probably made in Philadelphia, Boston, and New York those being the larger cities and having the largest concentration of tradespeople to be able to do that work. Janet was curious about the role of jewelry in men's fashion. If men in the 18th century wore things like necklaces or rings in mm. addition to these other items. Yeah, we don't have a lot of accounts of men wearing necklaces because obviously their neck is fairly well covered. Um, and so, not really a necklace, but certainly rings. I've got a few rings here. Uh, this ring is, is a fairly common type of ring to see on men, and this is a mourning ring, uh, a, a memento mor a mori ring, uh, either just to remind that you are mortal, uh, to remind you of death, or worn in memory of someone who had passed away. Rings with hearts on them are common. Um, we see them worn on a variety of fingers, but very commonly on the pinky in the 18th century. Um, same with this other ring, which is a bit larger, 
and it's just a, a silver cast ring with green enamel. So we do see men wearing uh, rings, um, but that's about the only kind of traditional jewelry, jewelry we see. You certainly do see sailors in the 18th century piercing their ears and hanging uh, earrings from them. So, uh, but a man wearing an earring outside of sailors and uh, a few types of military units at the end of the 18th century, um, it's not that common. Now we've had a few questions specifically about gloves. Uh, Brandon was wondering sort of if you could describe more of the functions of gloves. Were they purely fashionable or do we have say gloves that you're specifically going to wear to keep your hands warm? And then also you mentioned a little bit about the disposability of gloves. Janet was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about how that, how much something like that might cost in comparison to other type of tailored item. Yeah. Uh, so gloves can be very practical like today. Uh, they can be worn for protection for the hands at work, but they're not going to be the type of gloves that I just showed you. They're not going to be these thin, this thin leather. They're obviously going to have to be a thicker leather. But the amount of dexterity that you need from your fingers um, to do your work, obviously, are going to, that's going to help determine what type of glove you're wearing. For warmth, a leather, leather gloves are not going to do much for you. Uh, you're going to need a, a, a cloth. Uh, mittens are very common. Um, mittens are simple to make. Um, we know they're being sold ready-made. Uh, so mittens are certainly something. Uh, so either uh, we see them like mittens today where they're a single piece covering the hand and then the, the finger has a separate uh, digit to it. There are some that are three, so two fingers and then the thumb all having their own. Uh, but those are being made out of fabric or they're being knit. Um, so we know that those are being used. Uh, Diderot in his encyclopedia in the 18th century does depict some, some mittens as well as different types of gloves and the stitching used in making the gloves. Um, there's a lot of disposable fashion in the 18th century. I know we kind of feel today in our age of fast fashion that we're in the age of disposable fashion, but we're not the first ones to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, our entire freedom of the press uh, relies on us in the 18th century wearing out of our shirts, our shifts, our neckwear, and selling that off to the paper maker to be beaten to a pulp and made into paper and, of course, off to the printer uh, to print the news. Uh, as paper in the 18th century is all rag paper. Obviously, gloves being made out of leather are not going to be useful to the paper maker. Um, but leather was considered very inexpensive in the 18th century, um, especially that sheepskin and goatskin. Uh, they're quickly made, and so they're, they're not that valuable. Well, yes, there's about maybe six to eight hours of stitching in a pair of gloves. Uh, that labor, the labor of that seamstress or semster doing the stitching was not highly valued, and so they weren't paid that much. And so it allowed them to be fairly affordable. Now, the price for a single glove, I honestly, I, I don't know. Um, but obviously, it was such that people felt that it was more hassle to just to wash your gloves uh, than just to buy some new gloves. Jim was wondering about garters, and specifically, are garters limited to military use, or would you find folks here in Williamsburg on a day-to-day -day basis also employing that? Yeah, so Jim's asking about a separate garter to help keep the stockings up, as opposed to just the, the garter on the breeches. What seems to be most common in the 18th century is men use the garter on their breeches to keep their stockings up. It's women that use generally a tie garter around their, uh, either below or above their knee to help keep their stockings up. And that's less common for men here and less common in, in, uh, in English and in, in, uh, yeah, in English society to wear any type of tied garter. Uh, we see it being a part of other uh, nations' fashions, um, let's say, uh, French peasants, especially those uh, that go to French Canada, wearing tied garters. That seems to be associated with them. Why weren't 
the garters on their breeches good enough to do the job? I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you that the garter on a pair of breeches is certainly more than enough to tie around, uh, uh, to keep the stockings up and to keep the, the breeches secure below the knee. In his advice to uh, military officers, a uh, British officer by the name of Cuthbertson does mention the use of, of uh, a separate leather garter with buckle to help keep the stockings up. But he also mentions that the breeches uh, should just close with buttons so that there not be a strap and buckle uh, to keep uh, at the garter. But that's just his advice. Images of soldiers from the 18th century, British soldiers, really show knee buckles uh, and, uh, and, and, and knee bands uh, in use and don't show a garter, a separate garter also being used. We do know that there's a time during the American Revolution where a bunch of breeches are sent to American soldiers with garters on them, but there weren't any buckles, so they had to be converted uh, with a buttonhole and uh, a button uh, to close them. So actually, um, building off of really the last statement you just made there, Valerie had a question about what happens when war breaks out in North America, when the war for independence does break out. Uh, does fashion change notably now that maybe some of these imported goods are no longer accessible? How does this, a fashion, uh, how does this affect a, um, a men's accessories? Yeah, so the Fourth Continental Congress signs the Acts of Non-Importation in the spring of 1774. Those were to be enacted on December 1st, at least within all those colonies that had signed, the 13 colonies that had signed that agreement. So really after December 1st of 1774, we're not supposed to be getting these items from England. Of course, the purpose was that was to hurt those industries over in England, chief among them the textile industry, but it certainly would affect all the industries that made these buckles and watches and canes and neckcloths. And we we're hoping that those individuals will go to their members of parliament and say, look, we can't afford this. And if you want to get reelected, you can't afford this either. And so we were putting on economic sanctions, economic pressure to have our demands as colonists met. I don't think people expected it to stay in effect for as long as, long as it did throughout the war. Now, even though throughout those years of the war, um, from the first shots at Lexington and Concord all the way through the end of the war in 1783, uh, we're not regularly getting goods in from England. There is news regularly coming in from England. And so it's not that people weren't aware of the fashions. Uh, they certainly were. And how they followed those fashions, well, that's up to them and each individual person. We do know that Continental Congress and other community, uh, other colonies or newly formed states, governments tried to limit excessive purchases. Remember when I mentioned those black mourning gloves given out at funerals? Well, they actually said that that couldn't be done any, uh, anymore, at least during the war, because that was, well, wasteful. And so it was a practice that became technically illegal uh, during the years of the war. So we have uh, reached the time where it is really only time for one last question. And for that question, I was wondering if you might be able to draw some lines of connection or continuity from maybe 18th century accessories to how we accessorize today. Yeah. An 18th century person or 18th century man clearly did have those necessary accessories that are just serving a necessary function. Uh, uh, like those garter buckles at the knee or the neckwear. Um, and we have necessary accessories today. Um, of course, I think today in the 21st century in our menswear fashion, a lot of these accessories we wear, we might consider necessary, uh, while other people might consider them not necessary. Uh, for some men, uh, a wristwatch is a very necessary item. For other men, their cell phone is, a, is an equally necessary or more so necessary accessory, uh, but because they have their, their, their cell phone, they don't need their wristwatch. Hats today in the 21st century are worn by some men and not worn by other men. Uh, and so uh, whether it's the 18th century or today, you have choices. Uh, and so this idea that men in the 18th century wore all of these things or wore none of these things is, is not correct. 
Today, you have choice. And as I said, the 18th century man has choice as well. We need to remember to look at the past as being a place of individuals. Uh, and the time of our, Ameri uh, of our revolution is a time when individuals gathered together with their own interests, um, their own stories, but to, uh, to work together to create a common goal. Uh, and that's one of the great things we want you to take away with, uh, or take away from your visit here to Colonial Williamsburg. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your expertise and experience with us today. Oh, you're most welcome. And please, if you have any questions that maybe you think of later, go ahead and add them to this comment section, and I'll try to get to them later. Now, as we finish up, we would like to thank all of those viewing from home and for joining us today. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank our donors. Programs like this are made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. And to learn more about how you can contribute to our programming, please follow the link in the comment section or visit our website at www.coloniawilliamsburg.org. Michael, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with today? Well, thank you all for, uh, for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I certainly want to welcome you all back here with when our shop finally opens back up. Uh, right now, as far as we know, this coming Saturday, we'll be welcoming guests into the shop. And so it's very exciting for us. I, I hope you'll be excited to visit as well. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.